This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number two, recorded on March 4th, 2011, Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from the Medical University of South Carolina is Michael Schmidt. Well, Vincent, how are you this afternoon? I'm well. How's the um, Chamber of Commerce over there? The Chamber of Commerce weather? Well, it's not as good as it was on Monday, but it's, it's, it's going to be a nice weekend I'm hoping for. Yeah, up here it's still freezing. But we are north. Good to have you back again. Also joining us today from central New Jersey, Cliff Mintz. Hello, Vincent. How are you? I'm fine. How are you today? I'm well. Central New Jersey, is that a good place to identify you from? Princeton sounds more officious. Yes. But of course, you're not in Princeton, are you? (laughs) But I go there frequently. (laughs) That's okay. Close enough. From Princeton, New Jersey. Yeah, Princeton is quite the august place. Yes. And I, of course, am in New York City. So the magic of Skype brings us all together to talk about microbes. And today we have two stories to talk about to uh, improve your microbial education. And mine as well, I should say. I learned a lot last week. And uh, I think on TWIM I will learn quite a bit. So I'm looking forward to it. The first story that we're going to talk about was actually sent to me uh, by Alan Dove, my colleague on TWIV, one of the other podcasts I do. And that is a report from the CDC. This is in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which we've talked a lot about on TWIV, and and which is probably familiar to many. Uh, It is a documentation of various uh, diseases, not just infectious diseases, but uh, other kinds as well. And this one in particular is called Fatal Laboratory-Acquired Infection with an Attenuated Yersinia Pestis Strain, Chicago, Illinois, 2009. So this just came out uh, not too long ago, February 25th, and it's the result of an investigation of a fatality in uh, 2009. And just to briefly outline the circumstances before we start talking about it, this is a... um, An individual, a man 60 years old, who was a professor who had a laboratory who worked on Yersinia, was admitted in an outpatient clinic for fever of unknown origin. He'd had it for three days. A physician suspected influenza, referred him to an emergency room, but he he didn't go there. But three days later, he was brought back by ambulance because his condition had worsened. Uh, That was September 13th. And then they have the results of a variety of laboratory tests. Basically, after 12 hours, he was intubated because of respiratory distress and died an hour later. Then his laboratory uh, workups began to come in. It was known that he had worked in the laboratory uh, where Yersinia was present. His blood cultures were positive for gram-negative bacilli, gram-positive cocci, yeast, and then eventually they identified Yersinia by uh, PCR and sequencing of ribosomal RNAs. So then it became a joint CDC university investigation because Yersinia pestis is serious matter. And um, the, the, the issue here, which we should talk about now, is, is how he acquired this. He, in fact, was infected with a laboratory strain, which he worked with in the lab, and which was attenuated. It was actually a vaccine candidate. So um, who would like to, to weigh in on this? I'll start. Uh- The other remarkable thing that's found in the MMWR report is that this individual was also uh, suffered from diabetes. Mm -hmm. And as many of you who work in the infectious disease world, diabetes also predisposes you to a number of infectious agents. And so it it raises your risk level uh, somewhat. The other thing to take into account is that this time in 2009, we were in the uh, beginnings of the pandemic outbreak of 2009. Recall that in the spring of 2009, we had, I'm 
the influenza outbreak in New York City that came from Mexico that everyone had on their mind. And I think that's why one of his colleagues suggested he present to the ER and suggest flu. And any time you have a fever of unknown origin, it's really important to take the complete history of the individual. And it's, it's what's absent from this report is whether or not this individual actually volunteered at the time he was admitted as to whether or not he was working with Yersinia pestis in his laboratory. Do you think that would have made a difference in the outcome? I don't I don't know. I think it would have been chartered in passing because most emergency room of physicians, as much as I hate to say this, probably have heard of Yersinia pestis but have never experienced anything to do with Yersinia pestis. And in my experience, the docs in the ER are not infectious disease specialists. And since Yersinia infections are not very common or prevalent in the Chicago area, it may have been noted, but I suspect that they would have looked elsewhere considering that he would have said something like, I work in a laboratory with Yersinia pestis, but it's a, a attenuated strain or it's not you know, virulent, it won't cause disease to people. So uh, it may or may not have made a difference. I would have thought, um, as somebody who's worked with infectious agents most of my career, that that would have been the f- one of the first things that would have crossed my mind, that I may be- have infected myself. But not knowing the individual well, mm-hmm. um, a lot of microbiologists have, and I'm sure, Vincent, you can um, understand the feeling is that when you work with an agent for a very long time, you feel like despite any kind of incident, it's likely that you'll never be infected because after all, you're the person that works with the organism and whatever. (laughs) You get this kind of hubris that, you know, I know how to handle it and stuff. So a lot of times from a psychological perspective, emotionally, you don't want to go there because, you know, how, how could that happen to me? Yeah. But, but that said, going back to, I just wanted to introduce uh, folks who don't know what your Cynia pestis is. I think many people have have heard through taking history courses that Yersinia pestis was and has been shown using modern molecular biological techniques to be the causative agent of the Black Death or bubonic plague, which ravaged Europe and other places throughout history. And the other thing to understand is, is that even though it did cause those massive epidemics and outbreaks where lots of people died back in the so-called dark ages. It's really not a uh, persistent problem these days uh, in any part of the civilized world or the wet developed world. I don't want to say civilized, but developed world. And in fact, the reason why it is no longer a problem is, is that as some people may know, is that the, agent that transmits bubonic plague or allows people to be infected is the rat flea, fleas that live on rats. So the flea will bite a a rat that has a Yersinia infection. And as a result of that flea feeding on the rat, it will, in uh, regurgitating, taking up blood, the flea will then leave the rat and if humans are in close proximity to the rats as they were in the middle ages where there was no sanitation or vermin control or anything like that the fleas would jump off of the rat bite the skin of humans that were around and infect the humans with yersinia pestis now because we have much better sanitation in the uh, developed world, uh, we've eliminated the uh, life cycle, if you will. That is, there are rats around, but they are not in very rare in many places, and there's not the proximity of the rat, and thus the rat flee to humans. However, that said, in certain parts of the United States, for example, out west, in the western part, southwestern part, even west, Yersinia pestis is found in 
uh, prairie dogs and related rodents, and it's endemic. And what we mean by endemic is, is that the organism is present in those populations. It causes some disease, but not a lot. The organism is there. And if you go to places like Yellowstone and, and places in the Southwest, there will be signs saying, do not feed the prairie dogs. Now, or the rodents or whatever are around there. And most people think, well, you don't want to feed the park animals because it's not good to feed this, you know, you give them, you know, candy bars and stuff. But really what they want to do is reduce the exposure of people that are visiting the parks to the prairie dogs and other rodents to minimize the contact of or transmission of fleas from those wild rodents to unsuspecting humans. So I, I'm looking at MMWR, and it says that Yersinia is enzootic among rodents in western U.S. Yes. And that there are there are a couple of cases now. and In fact, this is from 2010, two cases in Oregon. Right. So when we say endemic, that means that it's there, and it does cause disease, sporadic disease. But in terms of worldwide pandemics or epidemic outbreaks of Yersinia, it just doesn't happen anymore because we understand through a lot of lot of research mm. about the life cycle and the, the need for infected animals to be in close proximity to a potential human uh, hosts. It says here that sleeping in the same bed with dogs has been associated with plague. Yep. Yeah, you lie down with dogs, <laughs> you wake up with sleep. <laughs> you wake up the, with plague. The, yes. the other adage we often... Uh, talk about is that the plague bacillus has yet to cross the great river, the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And that is really a, a great divider that has prevented the, the transit of that microbe across the country. And the Mississippi is actually the great divider that has prevented it from reaching the, the East coast. To the best of my knowledge, we do not have any Yersinia pestis uh, in, endemic in any of the wildlife uh, east of the Mississippi. So oftentimes, if you're one of these individuals who likes to go out hunting or hiking out west and you come home with a flea bite and you present with a fever of unknown origin on the east coast, you may stump the infectious disease physicians, while if you do the same thing on the west coast, they, of course, know to look for that particular agent when they do your workup. It's it's mm -hmm. the old adage, think horses and not zebras. Zebra, sure. Mm -hmm. So where does Chicago fall? Chicago is fortunately east of the Mississippi. Yes. And so consequently, um, it would not have been considered endemic mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. this individual's situation. Now, they treated uh, him with vancomycin and piperacillin. Mm -hmm. and tazobactam. So is this the appropriate treatment or would this have absolutely no effect? The interesting thing about Yersinia, now we're going to go into the life cycle of this microbe, it's a facultative intracellular parasite. So it's all about delivering the drug to the parasite to effectively knock it out. And so what they started him with was an empiric cocktail based on treating a general gram-negative sepsis along with a gram-positive sepsis. Mm -hmm. And so what the ID docs were doing is they were going with what works at their particular hospital for blood cultures that come back positive for gram-positive cocci and gram-negative rods. Remember, they didn't know at the time what he had they just knew he had a positive blood culture bottle that reported out gram-positive cocci and gram-negative rods. So they were going to the empiric standard of care for a positive blood culture bottle. If, he, if they had diagnosed Yersinia on day one, what would they have treated him with? They, they probably would have treated him with drugs uh, that are known to be able to pass into uh, macrophages, you know, sort of like... Uh, I, I read on, I, I don't recall exactly what the treatment is, but they're pretty heavy duty. A lot of times if it's a known infection, chloramphenicol is even used, which is a very toxic uh, antibiotic that works. Some uh, tetracyclines uh, would have been effective. Uh, some, uh, you know, even some 
penicillins or derivatives of penicephalosporins would have worked. But the thing is, is that the, the reason why he was so, um, so much in, in distress and stuff was that he once, maybe we should talk a little bit about the, how the, the pathogenesis or how the organism actually takes foot in, in the human body. And essentially what happens is, is that the human is, in this case, it's not clear there was no flea transmission because there were no rats, presumably, with rat fleas on them. So presumably, what like, typically what will happen is a flea will bite the skin, which would introduce, if an infected flea would bite the skin, the organism would be introduced. It would find its way into uh, the uh, lymph system through the bloodstream, get connected, dumped through the thoracic duct. And then eventually there would be a, a primary uh, bloodborne phase or bacteremia, and it would then seed the inguinal lymph nodes uh, of humans, which are in the, the crotch area. And I guess uh, that's where the, the bubonic plague gets its name. The bubos are the, the inguinal lymph nodes that would get very, very um, inflamed and enlarged and swelling if you were infected with your cynia. Typically, what would happen next if the disease was not treated, there would be a, a secondary uh, septicemia, uh, which probably was what happened to the investigator, where massive numbers of Yersinia would be dumped into the bloodstream. Once there's a septicemia, uh, it's very, very difficult to treat gram-negative infections. Uh, so the secondary uh, bloodborne phase would be then transport the organism to seed other organs. And sometimes in, in certain cases, the organism could take foot in the, um, the lungs. And when this happens, you get into a very different situation. Now you're in something known as pneumonic plague. And when the organism is in the pneumonic stage, people that are infected and have your cynia in their lungs can cough. And in fact, the droplets containing the Yersinia can then be inhaled or you know, somehow introduced into the, the body of uh, through droplets into another human, and you could get infected that way. So it's a variant. So in this case, when you've got pneumonic plague going on, you don't need the rat flea to transmit it from human to human. So that's where in the old days when people came down with the pneumonic plague, that's how it got amplified where people were just coughing. There was close contact. But there was no sanitation. People would stand over people. And they would cough. And you could imagine that, you know, that's why there were the massive, you know, the black death that swept through Europe in the Middle Ages. So one of the properties of Yersinia is, is that, as, as Michael suggested, is that it's able to live inside of white blood cells known as macrophages. And once the organism gets inside of the macrophages, it's in a protected environment. And a lot of antibiotics that would work for organisms that don't get inside of these macrophages would not work to treat Yersinia. So you really, as Michael suggested, you really have to have a very good idea early on that this was a Yersinia infection to treat it using algorithms other than the empiric standard antibacterial cocktails that many hospitals use for patients that have diseases of unknown bacterial origin. And the drug of choice is streptomycin, which is not routinely found in the ER with a secondary one being gentamicin. And so Mm -hmm. when you look at these things, you know, the rule of thumb when I was being brought up in the infectious disease world is you always want a cidal antibiotic, something that kills, because the static antibiotics, the ones that effectively just stop growth, effectively allow that organism to hide itself. And as Cliff so eloquently described how this microbe moves throughout the body, you really understand how Yersinia is such an effective killing machine. It literally walls itself off. And, you know, the term of creating these boo boos, um, and this is the derivation of the word boo boo that your mother used when you fell down and went boom, hmm. because you would develop the swelling 
that is one of the hallmarks uh, of plague. And so the trick here is, is really trying to deplete the microbial load before it gets out of control. And I think by the time this individual presented to the emergency room, the microbe had gotten a foothold to a level and extent that it was going to be extremely challenging, even if they guessed right and pulled out the streptomycin at that time and pumped it in to him. He may have already been too far gone by the time he presented to the ER. And I think that takes us to the next aspect of this case with the genetic component that the CDC is coming to teach us about uh, this, this condition where he had a large amount of iron that was available to this microbe to effectively foster its growth. Remember, iron is oftentimes the limiting reagent in many infectious processes. The human body ties up iron pretty tightly. We, we lock it down because it's such a precious resource to us because we use so much of it in making our red blood cells. I mean, it's the active component associated with our hemoglobin. And hemoglobin by itself is a, a curious molecule. It's effectively the box that we carry the toxic molecule around called oxygen. Many people probably don't think of oxygen as toxic but it's extremely toxic to cells if it's at too high of a concentration. And thinking about how we move oxygen around, we carry it around in an iron box, and then we expose it to our capillaries, show our capillaries the oxygen. It then gets the electrons from the electron transport chain and immediately becomes water. And so what this individual had is he had a high level of iron floating around. And so the Yersinia was able to harvest this iron, and this particular individual was of European descent, and folks who survived the Black Plague those hundreds of years ago, it's about 500 years now, um, those who lived actually deposited their genes into the gene pool, and typically those individuals um, had the same sort of condition, or at least had the gene for the condition that he had, enabling them to move iron away from the white blood cell and into organs to effectively hide it from the plague bacillus. But in this case, once the plague got out, it really took over and was able to take advantage of the additional iron that was sequestered in his tissues specifically his liver. So he presumably did not know of this condition beforehand. I would suspect not. So do you think that uh, if you are known to have hematochromatosis that you should probably not be working on this bacterium or maybe any others? You know, that's, that's a really good question. And I don't know whether or not um, I chair the biosafety committee at my institution and we evaluate everyone's science who works with an infectious agent or has recombinant DNA, and we effectively evaluate the risk. And so it's up to the principal investigator to present the risk to the committee. And it's an issue as to whether or not we would have considered his ancestry when we were evaluating working with an attenuated strain of Yersinia pestis. I think we would have looked at it and said, this is an attenuated strain and the risk is probably easily managed with biosafety level two precautions. Now, this individual's case is teaching us that maybe hemochromocytosis is a concern and should be factored into the risk assessment so that should an individual working with agents that are facultative intracellular parasites present to the emergency room or employee health that they should really aggressively consider uh, because it could have maybe made the difference in the drug of choice that they used when they were empirically treating them. Sure. My question is, would, would hemochromatosis make you also at risk for, say, Legionella, another intracellular pathogen? 
we know that Legionella does like lots of iron. So my suspicion is the answer would be yes, especially when you look at the original index cases of Legionella associated with that famous hotel in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I I would say, I I hate to disagree with Michael, but I would say probably not. Probably not would be a risk factor for Legionella? For Legionella, no. It's a a very different life cycle. And um, the interesting thing, I mean, from, you know, the transmission is is clearly not, it's not human to human. There's absolutely no um, ability to transmit it from human to human. So that eliminates that kind of aspect. So it's really a, an infection that's contained in the lungs. It, it does sometimes break out into a septicemia kind of situation, but it's not like plague. And I'm not sure that, you know, clearly iron has been shown to be a virulence factor in the uh, flea to human transmission of Yersinia. Uh, not so much in the direct introduction into the bloodstream, but in this case, as far as I can tell, the organism was a virulent because it was missing the ability to take up or f- get its own iron, you know, compete with iron in the body. Mm-hmm. So the fact that the iron was so was available, as far as I understand it, somewhere, uh, the iron kind of leached out and was able to get these guys an ability to, to grow where they typically in a normal human being would not have been able to grow. So it was just a weird confluence of events. And interestingly enough, it was an example of why doing laboratory research to understand why uh, organisms are virulent, that is why they're able to cause disease, whereas others aren't. It sort of makes sense that if the iron was limiting providing the organism with an inability to be virulent if you somehow add the iron back to the organism or the growth medium the human in this case where it doesn't require anything special there's just so much of it available or somehow can get it that virulence factor is no longer you know a a true absolute virulence factor in all cases so in this case Something that would be a virulent 99.9% of most people, in the case of people with this condition, it's it's not enough. And perhaps the strains that we label as a virulent aren't really as a virulent as we need them to be mm-hmm. to study them in you know BSL2 conditions, which doesn't require the investigators to do anything special other than wear safety glasses and, and possibly if you know, so desired uh, latex or disposable gloves, whereas, right? Yeah. Well, you know, Cliff, virulence, I always teach, is always relative. It depends on so many factors. And this this bacterium, which was supposedly avirulent, was not in him. Right. Right? But the interesting thing about Yersinia is, is that the, just, you know, it just, to me, it's amazing how much research has been done on this organism. I mean, it's, it's really a well understood the, the genes and their products that are responsible for pigmentation, infection by the flea, and then in the, in the bloodstream, and then how the organism actually gets into the macrophages and it uses a, 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 a secretion system, type three secretion system, which is universally in most cases used by gram negatives to penetrate uh, white blood cells, particularly macrophages and other cell types. The cell biology has been worked out. It's elegant stuff. And it's just amazing to see how one little piece, the iron piece, was yeah. really probably, even though it's not considered to be the main classical virulence factors of your cinea pestis, it shows you that how, as you suggest, Vincent, how multifactorial and how well-regulated and fine-tuned the relationship is between a pathogen and a and its host in that it's not absolute, like you're saying, that any small variable, if it's out of equilibrium within the context of virulence and infectious diseases, can result in a devastating disease. Sure. So I find it fascinating. I just want to comment about the 
iron issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, To give you a little bit about my background, I I grew up in the lab down the hall from Gene Weinberg at Indiana University. Okay. Okay. And so that's fair. Gene believed that iron controlled everything. (laughs) Yep. And um, the reason I knew about the Legionella is one of my classmates was working on Legionella specifically with the iron issue. And um, what they learned is that um, the avular macrophages require iron uh, for Legionella requires iron in the avular macrophages in order for them to grow. And so that's where that comment came from. Right. And Gene Gene made certain that I always said that iron controls everything. Well, I, I, I just want to agree with you, Michael, that iron is in, in most, in almost all cases of pathogenicity from the gonococcus to legionella to salmonella to Yersinia, uh, Vibrio even. I mean, the whole need for iron is really, really critical. It's just a question of, you know, how, how critical it is. And, 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 and the interesting thing about iron acquisition, uh, in my experience, has been that even if you knock out one iron acquisition system, there's a duplication within the microbe that you've induced a mutation and to somehow use an alternate mechanism to get uh, iron. So it, there's a whole level of redundancy that we see in, in pathogenesis and infectious uh, agents, and particularly bacteria, where something as critical as iron is going to, you know, you need it, it's going to happen. And um, if it's not there, it's a good way to, to stop the infection. But, you know, they compete very, very well, even if you knock out the first level of uh, iron acquisition. Because there's a lot of work in the gonococcus and Vibrio would take out the siderophores, the iron chelating or binding small molecules. And then there'd be mutations in outer membrane proteins or new proteins that were able to bind iron or compete with lactoferrin or transferrin. So, yeah, I think iron is really, really pivotal. But, you know, from a Gene Weinberg standpoint, you know, if you if you'd use, you know, give everybody EDTA, nobody would come down with diseases, right? Because you chelate all the available <laughs> iron. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you, Michael, how do you think that the professor acquired this infection? My suspicion is that it was probably an issue of hand hygiene. There was either hand hygiene or an aerosol. Since he was a geneticist, he was constantly probably picking and streaking. And any time that you would flame when you pick up a colony, he may have aerosolized it. Some of the aerosol may have ended up on his hands, or he may have inhaled some of the aerosol. It interacted with his mucosal surface, and it was then scarfed up by a macrophage. And the beauty of it being an intracellular parasite is that once it's um, taken up by a macrophage or another neutrophil, it then begins to spread. And as Cliff articulates, it it wanders the body and finds that niche where it can just make more. And being one of these organisms that relies on type 3 secretion, if any of you have had occasion to see Brett Finley's terrific animations of how type 3 secretion works, um, I encourage you to take a look at that because it really shows how elegant type 3 secretion is. They, these microbes make little molecular syringes that inject proteins into eukaryotic cells that then create a remarkable phenotype inside that eukaryotic cell that actually supports the growth and amplification of the microbe and then helps them evade the normal host defenses. And it was probably an aerosol issue where he flamed a colony. He didn't quite incinerate all of them. It then went on the air currents. He inhaled it. It hit his nose. And then it may have been, if you will, inhaled and then scarfed up by a macrophage. And then the rest, as they say, was history. Mm. So the things that we do routinely with bacteria in the laboratory, if, if you have a risk factor, can be lethal. And that's why personal protection equipment is so important. Uh, Cliff already said that typically biosafety level two requires um, normal precautions of closed doors in the lab, 
uh, following strict hand hygiene guidelines, and often eye protection. One of the ways to protect yourself when working with infectious agents is to protect your mucous membranes. And so if you were concerned about inhaling or a fugitive emission from a streaking or flaming incident, he could have simply worn a a surgical mask because it was a big enough aerosol that it would probably have been stopped by a simple surgical mask. Or if you were really concerned, you could go to the N95 mask, which must be fit tested. And if you have facial hair like Vincent does, then of course it, it becomes problematic to wear the standard N95 mask. And also they're not very comfortable to wear for prolonged periods of time. Vincent, I have a different theory. Okay, let's hear it. Um, since I am kind of like a hybrid geneticist and, and infectious disease guy, when I was doing uh, genetics on, on Legionella, I never, I very rarely used um, uh, my, my loop. I used toothpick, sterilized toothpick. And knowing that Malcolm was a geneticist, he may have been. I'm not discounting Michael's theory, but I, I agree with Michael. It was probably a hand hygiene thing. And it could have been that he didn't wash his hands or he smeared some stuff on and he forgot about it. He didn't wash his hands. There may have been an open wound. Uh, he may have stuck his finger up his nose uh, or something. Yeah. But it's clear that, you know, it, 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 pneumonia, they didn't show that it was pneumonic. I didn't think, I didn't think the lungs were infected. So I'm almost thinking that I, my scenario is is that there may have been like a, a, an abrasion or something where the Yersinia, again, if you don't, if they're avirulent and they don't have iron and you're not having a rat flea bite your skin, if the, the Yersinia are introduced into the bloodstream directly somehow, like through an open wound or get into a wound and then are taken into lymphatics where they like to be, they will grow out and whatever. But I... I I, I wonder if he actually experienced any inguinal yeah. swelling. Yeah, they didn't it, note that there are any buboes on the uh, report. Right. Yeah. But the interesting thing is I read a very interesting report where they were uh, looking at the role of uh, the loss of pigmentation with your cinea, uh, depending upon how you plate them out in the laboratory. And the fact is, is that if you lose pigmentation, you also lo- lose the ability because of the, the uh, uh, location in the uh, pathogenicity island that Yersinia has, like many other pathogens have, if you lose the ability to um, make the pigment, you also usually use the ability to to uh, acquire iron because the iron acquisition system is knocked out. And they actually did experiments where they took these uh, so-called avirulent mutants and directly injected them into mice. And surprisingly, they used 10 mice in this experiment. They were avirulent in normal or in, in the, uh, the, the virulent ones killed all the mice. And their expectation was that in the ex- experimental group using these avirulent mutants, which are known not to uh, cause disease, when they injected them intradermally into the mice, it didn't kill them. When they injected them intravenously, introducing the organisms directly into the bloodstream, two out of the 10 of the mice that were infected by the so-called avirulent mutants actually died from overwhelming systemic uh, Yersinia disease. And I have a funny feeling that that may be kind of what happened to Malcolm some, I mean, excuse me, the person some, some way uh, in that regard. And they were also alluding to that the mutation from uh, wild type to the loss of pigmentation in the iron is a very spontaneous mutant mutation that takes place rather frequently, leaving the possibility to notion that there have been, when you look at isolating Yersinia from patients, there are these pigment variants or mutants that emerge, suggesting that cla- there may be non-classical or atypical types of plague that go undetected or happen so infrequently that we're not really aware of the contribution of these multiple virulence factors too. And I think that goes back to one of the articles that is cited in the MMWR report from 1956, the virulence enhancing effect of iron on non-pigmented mutants of virulent strains of pasturella pestis. And so it 
I, I think in this particular case, it's as Vincent summed up so well, it's all about context. And in this particular context, this individual had an extra iron available for this non-pigmented, quote, attenuated strain. And because of the context of the attenuated strain, regardless of how it got in, the context of having that extra iron enhanced its virulence and actually then converted it from an avirulent microbe to a virulent one. And right. if he had been working at uh, biosafety level three, where the contact precautions would have been N95 mask and he would have been wearing gown and gloves, then he may not have inoculated himself or acquired it from the environment and it would have all been moot. But again, that goes back to the risk assessment component. This was risk assessed as a biosafety level two agent based on best practices. And now I think it's going to cause the biosafety community to take pause and say, well, individuals of the old world, I'm not even going to go to European uh, descent because I think plague, as best as I know, also occurred in China. It still occurs in India. And I think that the hemochromocytosis lesion may be in that population as well, but that's something for the human geneticist to answer. And so it may actually require that we sta change the avirulent pestis strains to actually for people to work with them at biosafety level three conditions because this case taught us well. Yeah, that would severely restrict uh, what you can do, I suppose, because there aren't as many of those facilities available. But uh, if the risk is such, then we should do that. Uh, I think it's interesting that here we had a, a researcher who wanted to teach and learn, and here in his death he has certainly taught something as well. Yeah, I think one of the th stories I read in, in the popular press from one of the uh, infectious disease physicians who took care of him and actually personally knew the individual, um, remarked that from the grave, this individual was screaming, hey, I'm trying to teach you something. Pay attention. Yep. And I think that's truly what this particular case report really describes pretty well. Yeah. I, I think, you know, in a similar, to echo a similar sentiment, is that infectious agents are infectious and you have to whether they you have to respect the fact that they are pathogenic organisms and whether they're avirulent or virulent you need to handle them safely according to laboratory guidelines and not to make any assumptions that a pathogen just because it's so-called attenuated cannot ca cause harm sure. and that's really you know you have to for people training in infectious microbiology, it's really, really important to understand that <laughs> these are things, these are organisms that you have to respect at all times and never to lose sight of the fact that they do cause disease. Yes, sir. That's certainly true. We are often guilty of being cavalier with our organisms, but you yes. have to respect them because they don't respect us. We are just <laughs> hosts for them. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to move on to our second story, which uh, is a paper that Michael discovered in MBio, and it is entitled Colonization-Induced Host-Gut Microbial Metabolic Interaction. And if you don't mind, Michael, I'd like you to summarize this for us. Well, this is a, a really interesting and, and fascinating story. This this is taking us into the realm of uh, a systems biology approach, if you will, to understanding how microbes interact with their host. And in this particular case, in this paper that's in the most current MBio edition by Kloss and other authors from um, uh, a number of laboratories, it's a really fascinating paper, and I encourage folks to look at it. What they have learned is that gut bacteria, which for many years have been associated with uh, various essential biological functions, we 
all learned that in our introductory micro course that good old E. coli gives us vitamins that we need. But here, in this particular story, with a systems-based approach, they were able to show that the gut bacteria um, contribute to essential biological functions in humans with respect to how we deal with our energy balance. They found that gut microbial colonization that occurs immediately after birth in parallel with other critical processes as uh, immune development and cognitive development, the microbial succession, if you will, as you take those initial organisms you get from your mother as you're going down the birth canal, and as that succession goes through, what happens is that um, you effectively are seeing that the microbes are influencing how we deal with fats. Specifically, there were a class of microbes that were associated with um, triglyceride balance, glycogen balance, and glucose balance associated with the liver. And in their really neat story, they did NMR, which for those of us who know, know what NMR is, it's called MRIs. Uh, they did MRI analysis on these mice, and they had germ-free animals as well as wild-type animals. And they asked in the notobiotic animals where you have specific agents that can be introduced, the agents being the bacteria, they asked the question, what is going on? And through some very sophisticated experiments, they would show that gut colonization induces a rapid weight gain associated with the stimulation of hepatic gluconeogenesis and triglyceride synthesis. So this is a first paper in this new systems-based approach. They did all the techniques that many microbiologists are familiar with, density gradient gel electrophoresis, uh, 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing to characterize the community. They harvested stool samples on a time-dependent manner, comparing and contrasting germ-free animals against their controls. And they were able to see some very interesting differences by modeling liver function and weight gain. And they have some really neat plots without getting too deep into the weeds of the methods. They did some really sophisticated statistical analysis in order to tell our story. So let me see if I understand this. So we have germ-free mice with no bacteria in their guts, and then they simply put them together with the wild-type germ-plus mice in the same cages. No, 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 right? no, they, no, the different cages. And how do, they, how cages. do they, they colonize the germ-free mice? They, they give them a cocktail. They give they give them a cocktail. Okay. Uh, t typically, they feed it to them. Yes. And where does this and, where does this cocktail come from? Uh, the other mice? I'm checking. I believe yes. I haven't quite gotten through all of their detailed methodologies of trying to figure out where things are. Yeah, they were taken out of the isolators and housed in the same environment as the conventional ones. So you're correct, Vincent. They got it from their friends. Which, of course, happens to us at birth. That's how we get colonized, I guess. We get it from our, our mothers and brothers. So they put these mice together. They get colonized. They, they gain 52% of their total weight gain over the first five days. So these, And then their metabolic studies are showing that uh, all this... All this gluconeogenesis and other metabolic activities are taking place, and presumably the bacteria are helping helping the mice to metabolize and produce uh, precursors that they require for growth. Is that correct? Correct. That's the simplified version. And then they also, as you said, they, they monitor the bacteria by sequencing ribosomal RNA. They have this wonderful progression. Figure three is a progression of the... Um, the colonization of the gut over the first 20 days or so, and they, they have it in pie charts. It's just beautiful and all these various uh, bacteria that are present. And then eventually, I guess it reaches some kind of a homeostasis where the population is stable and then you're an adult mouse. It's that dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium. 
the thing that's so impressive about this paper is that, you know, again, as Michael said, it's a systems biology approach and, you know, Notobi- colonization of notobiotic animals is something that's been studied for 30 or 40 years or something like that. When I was in graduate school, there was a guy at Wisconsin that was, you know, studying the immune response as relates to um, colonization of notobiotic or germ-free mice. So the fact that they were able to show the progression of the colonization of the, the gut and then show using elegant uh, metabolic and other studies to show that there is a correlation between secession of colonization to a, a specific mammalian function is is really outstanding work as far as as I can tell. I mean, it's just elegant, elegant work. So, do we do we think a similar thing happens in human babies when they are born? They are colonized, and then similar things are happening, or or do we have to look and and find out the answer to that? We know that the human gut goes through uh, a succession. And that's part of the NIH's microbiome project. They're actually looking at uh, various body sites, asking about the the microbial community associated with that. And I think this particular paper, the reason I thought so highly of it is because I think it will serve as a primer of how we can ask what-if stories and consider the scenario in the average human. The last story we talked about, we asked the question about antibiotics, and these were broad-spectrum antibiotics. You almost have to ask the question, how will the host respond to an antibiotic regimen, Mm -hmm. and what will go on in the gut, and what goes on metabolically uh, in the human host when you disrupt this dynamic equilibrium with antibiotics. And so I think some of the tools that they use to answer their question using these mice, and they had the advantage in that the mice were genetically identical. That's the other thing that they have going for them when using mice is they're genetically identical. Unfortunately, people aren't genetically identical. And so comparing and contrasting to the human condition I think is going to require a systems-based approach where you do some of this fancy um, MRIs and metabolic profiling at the same time of characterizing stool samples and plus and minus antibiotics. So this paper, I think, is really going to be one of many that we're going to be seeing uh, in the future because of how powerful the analysis was and able to tell their story, as you, Vincent, said about the whole issue of weight gain. And as we know, triglycerides and right. glucose metabolism and glycogen synthesis are the hallmarks of type 2 diabetes. Diabetes, hmm. right. And, and so ask yourself the question here, looking at this one microbe that was implicated in, in a class at I had forgotten about, you know, you you learn all these bacterial names and they throw in this Choreobacteriaceae. And so here's a (laughs) pop quiz for the listeners. Is this gram positive or gram negative? And the answer is it's it's gram positive. But this Choreobacteriaceae was associated with hepatic metabolism. So you almost, especially with the triglyceride levels. So there are significant correlations between bacteria and hepatic levels of triglycerides, glycogen, and glucose are presented in figure four and also in their supplemental figure. And so as you dig through the weeds of this paper, you really find how this may suggest a role for probiotics in treating some of these metabolic conditions that we have. And that's, again, the power of this paper, because now you can imagine how you could do a clinical trial with a probiotic, asking the question, harvesting stool samples, using the techniques we're all familiar with, DGG, 16S sequencing, and this MRI aspect to ask what's going on to determine whether probiotics may have a role 
in being able to ameliorate some of the uh, symptoms or maybe even preventing some of these metabolic diseases that seem to be at epidemic proportion in the developed world. I don't know if you remember that we covered a story on TWIV some time ago about a a gastroenterologist who was treating individuals with various bowel diseases, and he was improving them by giving them fecal transplants from their spouses. Oh, yes. Yes. (laughs) Same idea. These people, apparently the idea was, the hypothesis was they had an imbalanced gut microbiota, and they could restore it by putting in the bacteria from a healthy individual. So it's the same idea here, except we're going to get more precise at knowing the populations in the gut. Well, I, I think it's really interesting that um, you know you have these stories about eating yogurt and all this stuff and how they've gone on for centuries, and then you have the whole concept of uh, traditional Chinese medicine and and things like that. But you know the fact that you know eating yogurt is supposed to, according to the old Dan and yogurt commercials, enhance longevity and and you know improve health. It, it kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, obviously when you're eating yogurt, there's a lot of gram-positive lactobacilli and, and related gram-positive uh, bacteria. But it's clear that changing the microflora has long been known to have positive effects as well as negative effects when you decimate the balance by long-term antibiotic treatment. But it it it, it really speaks volumes to what Michael was saying that, there is a big probiotic movement now using uh, you know, probiotics rather than antibiotics and, and related compounds to treat disease or treat conditions. And I think showing that you could use metabolic readouts uh, and, and its effect on, on the host uh, rather than looking for health indicators makes it a very interesting and different you know, kind of uh, perspective. But you have to know what to put back into people, right? What particular mixture of bacteria. Right. But if you're, if you look at a probiotic and probiotics have very different mixtures of bacteria, you can begin to uh, using some of the tools here, see what is going on. And maybe, you know, yogurt may be good to, uh, you know, control some infection, but for type two diabetes, maybe if we give somebody a healthy dose of the Karate bacteria that they'll upregulate turnover of glucose quicker and reduce the severity of the type 2 diabetes. I don't know. Right, sure. You know, it kills me. My, so my kids, they have acne. So what happens? To get the dermatologist prescribes an antibiotic. Right. And I'm just thinking, what is this doing to your gut flora? Well, here's, here's a hypothesis. Since we've used antibiotics liberally for the last 50 years, what epidemic has occurred within the last 50 years? And the answer is diabetes. Now, is, is that because we're eating less well than we did in the previous 50 years? Or is it because the microbes in our gut have sufficiently changed because of routine use of antimicrobials? Mm. And that is the consequence associated with the epidemic of type 2 diabetes in the developed world. So basically what has to be done is epidemiology to look at the gut microbiome in people with diabetes. And not. Yeah. And right? not. People, and not, yeah, of course, yeah. controls, healthy controls. Is that being done? Do we know? It's all part of the NIH's human uh, microbiome project. They're, they're looking at normal individuals first. And then they're moving out to Mm -hmm. individuals with various uh, diseases. They're, of course, going to go after normal adults. They're going to go to children and newborns. And the one thing that I thought was remarkable in this paper and caused me to think is they were looking at the succession in the new gut. Now, the Dannon commercial is always talking about the longevity of eating yogurt. And so now ask yourself the question, are microbes responsible for aging? And does our gut age with time? And so I think we need to look Mm, at the guts of middle-aged individuals and as they move into their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 100s and ask the question, is the gut of a centurion different than the gut of a 60-year-old? because we may be able to learn what microbes are necessary or associated with longevity. 
Michael, are you saying we can someday take a probiotic pill and live another 40 years? Well, you may be able to live well because <laughs> the, the, the folks who, you know, make it to 100 typically have lower incidence of heart disease. They're not on very many medications. And so, you know, having been brainwashed as a microbiologist, I think all things are infectious or have a microbial component. Going back to Elio Schechter's Talmudic questions, can you name a disease process that does not have a microbe associated with it? And, you know, you're hard-pressed to scratch your head trying to come up where there's not a microbial trigger or a microbe involved. And so I think we have to really look at the systems approach to really understanding human health. And I think it, it's the, the cap of TWIM, you know, what we're effectively discussing. Yeah. How about susceptibility to infectious diseases also determined by these gut microbiomes? So I know a lot of viruses that initiate infection in the gut Perhaps the microbiome has a, a role to play in that. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, the bigger picture of this, you know, from, from my perspective is that, as Michael said, we talk about infectious diseases and how, how bad microbes are, at least bacteria are infectious agents, pa bacterial pathogens are. But when you look at the, the positive benefits of bacteria to the health and well-being of humans and other animals, it's clear that... Society needs to look at bacteria a little bit differently because for all of the bad diseases that they cause, there's so much other positive things that they bring to uh, humanity that I think that, you know, bacteria have gotten a really bad rap. Viruses deserve the bad rap. There's no well, question no, about there that. Well, no, but there are, Cliff, there are good viruses also, <laughs> I, I know, guarantee I know. it. <laughs> The ocean is full of them. <laughs> I know, I know. And, and for our <laughs> listeners, I highly recommend March of the Microbes by... John Engelhard, is that the name? Let me look it up. It's John Ingram. Oh, John Ingram wrote that. Wow. Guys, you got if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's it is a, it's wonderful. a wonderful book. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful book. It's about this whole thing. Not only are they bad, but they are mostly good. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the previous issue of MBio, there was a very short perspective article. It was entitled A Systems Biology Approach to Infectious Disease oh, yes. Research. Yes. Innovating the pathogen host research paradigm. So if you're not familiar with this notion of systems biology, this short, very approachable five-page article or perspective in MBio really describes what the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases is doing to embrace systems biology. There are four system biology centers that were funded by the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease. One's entitled Systems Influenza, the other TB Systems Biology, Systems Biology of Enteropathogens, and Systems Virology of Emerging Respiratory Viruses. And it really is an interesting perspective, um, giving you a sense of the wonder of how microbes and system biologists are going to be getting together in the very near future to approach this uh, problem, to really make use of the, the new tools that we now have available. Sequencing is really terrific, but what do you do with it? <laughs> and I think yeah. now the systems biologists have finally figured out what to do with it. I uh, visited one of those systems biology centers a few weeks ago in uh, University of Washington, and I did a podcast with Michael Cates, who is the PI of, of the, that Systems Biology Center. So I, I direct you to a, uh, a recent TWIV, I think it's 121, uh, where we had a panel discussion about using systems biology and, and virology. It's quite interesting. I think we ought to move on to uh, our email. We actually have three this week. So since our last episode, we've received three, and I'm sure that will continue. Uh, the first one is from Barbara Hyde, who is the communications director at the American Society for Microbiology. And she writes, in the discussion of copper, it should be noted that copper has long been added to marine bottom paints as an anti-fouling agent. Now, however, there is concern about deleterious environmental effects from its leaching out into the waters. Anyone know anything about this? 
I don't have a boat, so I can't. I don't know anything about it, but I know that there there are boats that are painted to prevent fouling. So, so the, you paint the bottom of the boat to prevent the boat from corroding. Is that yes. right? Yes. No, to prevent the barnacles, barnacles from, from, from attaching to it. And the copper prevents the barnacles from doing this? Because of its ubiquitous yes. anti microbial anti-cellular activities. But anytime you go into seawater, it seawater is a corrosive environment. Any of you who have boats know that you put a zinc plug on, on the end of your boat so that the corrosion attacks the zinc rather than your mm. motor. And so it's, I think, the corrosive activity. If you could figure out how to make the proper copper alloy that would not be leached in seawater, you would have the same anti-fouling activity, and yet you wouldn't have to worry about the copper leaching out into the water. And that's all about alloy development. So the copper leaching in the water is a problem because, what is it? Well, the, the, the copper goes out into the water, and, and of course, soluble copper, of course, will compete with magnesium in chlorophyll. And recall that magnesium is the active metal in chlorophyll that provides for photosynthesis. And so that's that's the worry there is copper will compete with the magnesium in, in photosynthesis. So you, of course, have many photosynthetic processes going on in water. Right. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Barbara. The next one is from Kevin. First of all, thank you so much for providing myself and other microbiologists with this excellent podcast. Your very first episode was extremely fascinating to me, and I will be avidly waiting for all future episodes. I hope you and your friends can maintain this caliber for your podcast. I am an analyst in the microbiology laboratory at a modest-sized pharmaceutical manufacturing company. For those of you familiar with pharmaceutical microbiology at a sterile manufacturing site, you would understand why the discussion of the laboratory studies on copper as an actual self-sanitizing material would be interesting. For the most part, you talked about possible applications in hospitals, but I would love to hear Michael Schmidt's and others' opinion on possible manufacturing design changes if the FDA were ever to support them. Currently, laminar flow hoods, isolators, and most equipment in a sterile facility seems to be made out of 316 stainless steel. You already mentioned that stainless steel can easily harbor bacteria on its surface, but would using copper as an alternative really be that much more effective? Stainless steel can be polished smooth enough to ensure no bacteria hide in cracks or irregularities in the surface when sanitizing agents are used. Speaking of sanitizing agents, could you even hope to sanitize a copper material with a strong oxidizer like bleach or hydrogen peroxide? Even an autoclave would be brutal on copper utensils such as forceps or hemostats. You would almost be making disposable metal materials. I would love to see what the minimum concentration of copper you would need in an alloy in order to keep a 10 to the 3 or possibly even 10 to the 6 reduction in microorganisms. Also, I'd be very interested in seeing how a spore-forming organism reacts to contact with copper. Is the spore formation process quick enough to save a bacillus species organism from certain death? These are the kinds of questions that popped into my mind immediately, and I'd love to hear your takes on them. I think you should go to graduate school and work <laughs> for Michael question. in the lab. That's what I think. We'll start with the simple answers. Uh, there have been excellent studies done by uh, William Keevil from the University of Southampton in Britain that have been published and applied in environmental microbiology as well as other notable journals. He's established that copper does indeed kill spores. Uh, it kills Clostridium difficile quite well and uh, very effectively. And so the answer is yes, you can kill spore formers. The issue about the uh, bleaches and peroxides, it's again related to the alloy. The EPA, which granted the uh, claim that copper has antimicrobial properties, defined the definition of what antimicrobial means in the sense of this metal. This metal our pure metallic copper and its associated alloys must have a minimum concentration of 60% copper in order for them to be antimicrobial. And they will kill 99.9% uh, .9 of the organisms deposited on that surface within two hours. That is the standard that has been set 
by the EPA, and that was using the equivalent of 10 to the 7th organisms at the time. Uh, the EPA has a very prescribed set of tests one must do in order to uh, see the kill. The other questions uh, about 316 stainless steel, uh, many of us in the lab already have incubators that have copper walls. Um, those of you who do tissue culture out already know that antimicrobial copper has been used in tissue culture incubators for many years, even before the EPA granted the claim that it was antimicrobial. Strong oxidizers like bleach or hydrogen peroxide, again, depending upon the alloy, are not corrosive. And when you polish stainless steel to that high mirrored finish, that costs a lot of money. While with the antimicrobial copper, any alloy that has greater than 60% copper in it, it's continuously antimicrobial regardless of its, of its polishing. And you can, of course, polish copper to this high sheen that you can in 316 stainless steel. But the question is, do you need to? considering that it will work regardless of whether or not it's uh, tarnished, uh, whether it's uh, developed that green patina. So I think the FDA is going to take a, a significant look at this as more of these applications are used. So I, I, all of these are terrific questions, and if you want to come to graduate school— you always use a good set of hands. All right. He, he ends up by writing, I'm a 25-year-old analyst at this company with slightly over four years of industry experience. I would be ecstatic if you could take some time in an episode to describe the differences between industry and academic microbiology, focusing on some of the progression or hierarchy in those different fields. In my undergrad, my classes were entirely pre-med focused, and it was only by chance that I ended up in the industry. Now, knowing what I do about pharmaceutical manufacturing, I wish that I had known more so I could have prepared a more efficient method of getting further in this field. An MBA would make becoming a manager supervisor so much easier, and a PhD would make a senior scientist level more tangible to me. As it stands now, I have no idea how to get further ahead, but a five-year break from college keeps me reluctant to go back to school and start all over again. Thank you once again for all you do, and best of luck in your research and with this podcast. Well, Kevin, we will put it on the TWIM wish list and uh, I know that Cliff knows about that perspective, the industry versus academics. So we'll we'll do an episode where we talk about it. Is that a good idea, guys? It's a great idea. It's a terrific idea. Our last email is from David. He writes, Hi, I'm a new student of microbiology at UBC, working in the Redfield Lab. I found your podcast very informative and am looking forward to future episodes. If you're looking for interesting people, I'd like to suggest my supervisor, Rosie. Among other things, she has a lot of interesting things to say about the recent arsenic bacteria issue. Mm. Please say hello to Professor De Pommier. I've never met him, but a few years back, we talked about an unfruitful venture to get vertical farming going in Vancouver. So I know Rosie Redfield because she wrote a blog post about the arsenic bacteria issue several months ago. It was really well done, and she got a lot of publicity from that. So we would love to have her on at some point, and maybe when the next arsenic paper comes out, we can get her thoughts on it. Thanks, David. So thanks for writing, and all of you, of course, you can also send in your questions and comments. There are a couple of ways you can do that. You can send an email to twim at twiv.tv. You can go over to microbeworld.org slash twim, and over on the left side of the page, there's an area where you can click to leave a comment. TWIM is now on the iTunes store and also at the Zoom Marketplace, so you can subscribe for free and automatically get each new episode as we post it, and that will be every other week. You can also listen with your iPhone or Android phone using the Microbe World app, which you can find at microbeworld.org. You can also go to microbeworld.org slash TWIM and play the episodes right there, download them, and check out our show notes. Finally, if you have a story you'd like us to talk about, you can either send it to us by the methods I've told you or go over to microbeworld.org and add it and tag it with TWIM. Cliff Mintz, thank you for joining us again. It was a pleasure, Vincent. Always good fun. Cliff is at BioJobLog.com. 
www.medicaluniversity.com. Michael Schmidt, thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Pleasure. Medical University of South Carolina, where the weather is very nice these days, much nicer than it is up here. I am Vincent Racaniello, and I'm at virology.ws. I'd like to thank ASM for supporting TWIM, Communications Director Barbara Hyde, Chris Condian and Ray Ortega for their organizational and technical help. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.